Hi everybody, I'm getting in before the comments start. I do know the audio quality for this episode wasn't to my usual standard. Both the guest and I were experiencing internet connectivity issues and I'm learning a new software program. It's not going so well. With that being said, the conversations are always organic and natural and I don't want to re-record them or ask the guests to do so anyway when they're giving up their time. So please bear with us. It's a great conversation and provides valuable insights to the Special Forces world. Enjoy. It was, a, it was a dangerous bit of ground to drive through and we kind of underestimated um, that village and that piece of land and that pass and we drove through anyway. He took an RPG to his vehicle. Day four turned into day five and now we're down to pretty much zero water, zero food. Radio batteries were becoming an issue. Have you ever wondered what it's really like being a Special Forces operator? Well, today's guest went from police officer to pilot and spent 20 years in the Australian Army, 15 of those in special operations as a commando. He is the definition of quiet professional and I managed to get a few stories out of him of adrenaline pumping missions to everyday challenges, providing insights and a deeper understanding of the sacrifices and triumphs for those that have dedicated their lives to service. Episode 107, Murray Turner. The One Moment Please podcast. Yeah. I'm really excited to have a chat to you. We um, got put in contact via a mutual mate. You obviously know him in a much different context than I do, um, which is Troy. And, um, yeah, he said that you're an absolute legend and really have helped him out in terms of his post-transition as well. So I'm happy to have a chat to you today in regards to your career and your post-transition and and really um, hear some awesome stories, I would say. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. Good intro. Yeah, Troy's a, a good mate of mine. You're right. We worked together for many years. He's a solid dude. So yeah. Good to see him doing well these days. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So you ended up in as a Special Forces Commando, but what made you join the Army in the first place? Because you actually started off in the New South Wales Police. Yeah, you're right. I started uh, in the police in 1990, so I finished school in 88, back in the day. And uh, and that was in Broken Hill. So there wasn't much going on out there as far as excitement goes. Traditionally, everybody become a miner. You know, they're a miner, they're a carpenter in the mine, they're an electrician in the mine. And I'm like, there's no way I'm doing this. It's great. I respect those guys, but I don't know. There was an element of of me that wanted some adrenaline and excitement. Um, so initially I was keen on flying jets. Um, it, you know, this is post Top Gun era. There's a couple of years, so I was fresh in everyone's mind and, you know, danger zone. Top Gun's, got, like, a lot to, Top Gun's got a lot to answer for, doesn't it? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and Charlie Sheen's Navy SEALs. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. Oh, that's a whole different story, isn't it? Um, but thank God I didn't get in. I wasn't smart enough, so high five. Um, so my next door neighbor, um, submitted the police application on my behalf for me. I think he even forged a signature. I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm like, I'm going top gun. He's like, let's go to the cops and we'll sort out later. Um, so he submitted it and a month later I get a letter saying, you know, report to Goulburn pretty much next month on whatever it was in January of 1990. So I was like, what the hell? And he comes in and he's like, yeah, I got my letter. Woo. We're going to the cops. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, yeah, whatever, let's do this. You know, this sounds cool. It's It ticks that box for me. It's got the excitement element to it. You know, cops, chases and shootouts. Uh, I thought, so let's go. So we're at Goulburn, you know, in January of 1990. And uh, six months later, marched out of there and got my posting to Flemington um, in Sydney there. I didn't have a clue where it was. People were talking Auburn and Flemo and Marrickville. And I'm like... At are they in Sydney? Where, where are these places I'm hearing about? And they're like, oh, Mars, poor Mars from the bush. Yeah. So, yeah, got posted to Flemington and stayed there for two years in the city as a cop. Worked out it wasn't all that it sort of, they advertised it to be. How so? I think, and you know, and we were talking before the, before you press play on my lack of IT skills and how I just, I need to do hands-on stuff, right? I'm a hands-on learner. Um, I need to see and replicate and I can do pretty much anything, but 
you know, paperwork. And back then it was all this, of course, right in the nineties. So, you know, yeah. I couldn't index solve. finger, two index fingers. Oh, everybody is listening. Totally. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, wrong. You know, so that was a nightmare. Oh, you're and full was... typewriter. You're on the full oh, typewriter then. Writer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. You're re- okay. Really old school. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of even pre-electric typewriter days. So, you know, this is way. And um, there was a lot of that. I, I didn't like the typing. I didn't like the paperwork. I didn't like the forms. And where we were, there was a lot of car accidents. So there's lots of car accident forms, you know, night and day, all shift. And I'm like, are we actually going to do some cool stuff? And I guess it is dependent on where you are, of course, right? So we had plenty of highways. So it was all car accidents. It wasn't shootouts and chasems and robberies and whatever. We had a few, but um, so after two years of that, I thought, well, you know, I've kind of had it with the cops and being a young constable in Sydney, paying Sydney rent prices, um, you know, it, it, is this for me for the next four years? I don't know. So so I left, yeah, and went back to Adelaide and um, did it like a year, year and a half back in Adelaide. And by then Rwanda had kicked off. And so this is like 94 and the year before in 93, Somalia. And Australia sent some troops. We sent some combat units to those um, to those theatres. So there was stuff happening, um, and there was enough to for, to spark my interest. And I thought, well, this could be could be good. You know, it's a good time to get in. I think um, I love being fit. I love the hands on approach to you know shooting, and I'd done plenty of shooting growing up in Broken Hill. So I enjoyed that discipline. Um, you know, and and essentially getting yelled at, and I've got an ACD, I think, anyway. So having stuff neat and tidy sort of works works for me. But you liked getting yelled at. I enjoyed the discipline element of it. You know, that's there's... not what I asked. That's not what I asked, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. I was twenty three, right? So the young young kids who were eighteen were, were all crying, and you know, couldn't understand what, why this was happening not understanding that it, it is a procedure you know they got to break you down and, and then build you up into the, you know their soldier so don't panic it's all going to be fine you know um so yeah i was a couple of years older because i'd done the cops before that did you go direct entry into the commandos or did no. you go s- no this was basically standard for, yeah standard route. i think that kicked off in maybe 0203 um post 9-11 um, so back then it was kind of infantry for a couple of years and then pick your poison after that. So um, my whole crew essentially from um, uh, from Kapuka went to Singleton, which is your, your advanced infantry training. So the whole crew went to infantry and then we all went to Townsville together. So we were in uh, Tuaria in Townsville, which is an infantry battalion. Um, so that was that was good. That was um, hot in Townsville and learning. Yeah, you know, really hot. Yeah, I know, right? Learning the the way Townsville does business, and um, so that tested you with the you know, cane toads. Was, oh, the cane toads and the water and the rain and the you name it, the the tully and the oh, you know, it's uh, it's jungle up there essentially too, right? So it's mm. a whole different kind of warfare, and it, it's hard out bush when you're wet and tired and hungry as opposed to being dry, I guess, tired and hungry. So we went to Tully a lot, which was their jungle training area just up the road from Townsville. So, you know, they utilized it all they could, you know, so you would went out field for two weeks, three weeks, a week, whatever. And you're wet on day one. Mm. And uh, everything's wet. Was this normal training or was this the commando training? This is normal training. No, this is just regular, regularly. Oh, training yeah yeah so after like three or four years of that i i thought i gotta get out of here a because of the heat and b i want to be a better soldier you know there was nothing happening back there and you could see guys in a rut you know who were going to stay in infantry their entire career who had no incentive or motivation to be better to be a better soldier and uh and then I hear at the commander unit that got raised in 97 and some of my friends did the 98 course. So I put my name down and did the second of 98 selection course in Holsworthy. And so when you're saying the commando unit was raised, it was formed? Yeah, it, it was around uh, pre-1997 as a commando unit, but it kind of had, um, had regular infantry guys in it with some 
um, high instructor, uh, qualified commando guys that had done the reserve commando courses previously. That's how they sort of sold it as a commando unit, but it hadn't had fully um, long-term um, qualified, full qualified guys in it before 1997. So you were one of really the, like the new kids on the block really going through. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you're right. We, we did the second course in 98. So the first course ran in, I think like February or March. So our instructors on my course in like October, November were the guys that did the previous course only nine months before. Oh, wow. Okay. So we're learning on the move and it was a, you know, high tempo period. And, you know, a lot of the core skills weren't there. We were all motivated. Um, but the unit was learning on the move. Yeah, for sure. How, so how many were on the selection course for the commando? Um, there would have been 120, 130 guys. And how many at the end? Um, probably, probably 40, probably 35, 40 guys um, finished and were selected. How did you find that process compared to when you said that the 18-year-olds were crying when they were doing regular army boot camp, really? How did you find the difference in terms of the guys that were going through the course and wanted to be there? Um, they were, they knew what they were there to do. So there was no illusion, right? We kind of, you know, read enough books and understood the dynamic in, in special forces enough because you had SAS around at that point. And we've read plenty of books and, you know, the commandos, the Z-Force back in World War II in New Guinea. So we kind of knew it was going to be hard and, you you know, you wanted to prepare your body and prepare your mind for what was coming. Um, so everybody kind of knew what they needed to do. So physically to get fit, you know, six months before, you know, start a program and really build it up. So you kind of peaked on the course, you know, because you want to keep your muscle and keep your good body weight, you know, you, you're going to deteriorate, your body's going to fall apart, but it's all about managing where that happens on the course. Um, so I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the build-up training. I enjoyed reading and finding out, you know, what was going to happen to the body and in what time frame it was going to happen. So there was no surprises. And everybody, we had enough group intelligence to work out, you know, what we needed to do and how to get through it. And we could hit up the guys from the, the course that, you know, happened nine months before as well and, and you know, find out exactly what they went through. How long is the selection process into the commandos? These days, I've got no idea. I think it's sort of about a three-week um, selection course. Um, it was a little bit different when I did it. Um, back then, it was like a, a two-week course, and then you had a week off, and then you did a month-long course. Um, so there was different tempos and different schedules they ran back then. But I guess the, the good part of that was the first two weeks, they just smashed you for the sake of it to try and break you and to test your physical um, and mental strength. So you didn't have to think too much, right? You, you could just get beasted and do 20 and 30 clickers and, um, you know, hill runs and swims and, you know, zero 0200 um, swim sessions that finished at five in the morning without having to learn anything. So you really didn't have to switch on. So that, that's kind of a luxury, actually, where you can just smash your body. And then you got a week off and then we we started. We're such month. different people. <laughs> yeah. I... <laughs> a luxury to get beasted for two weeks. Okay, keep and, going. And switch your brain off. Yeah, I know, because okay. we didn't really get taught much. So that happened... A week later, we started the month-long course where you had to, they taught you stuff. You had to learn commando tactics while being beasted 23 hours a day. So, yeah, you had to stay awake or try and stay awake at least anyway, give the idea that you, you were awake. Um, were you in a relationship at this stage? Uh, no, no. No, I was single. Um, so yeah. you were able to 100% focus on 100 getting through focus. and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. Like guys, guys will look for an option to get out of it. You know, the brain sort of wants to, wants your body to stop. And if it's, you've got kids or you're in a relationship or you're, you're in a relationship that's going south, it's easy to say, oh, you know, this is all too hard. I'm never going to be home once I get to the unit anyway. I love my wife, love my girlfriend, love the kids. 
yeah, it's easier to tap out if you've got something to go back to. Did you realize that you were that mentally strong before you did the course? Like, did it surprise you that you passed? Um, yes and, and no. Like, there was times I wanted to tap out. Like, there was, you know, a day that we did a stores carry for, I don't know, 18 hours, dragging boxes and ammo liners up a hill. And I had to stop and got four, four bags put in me. Um, you know, and at that point you want to stop because it's easy, right? You're in a tent for half an hour while they're squeezing all these bags in there to hydrate you again. And it's easy to go, hey, listen, you know, I could just hop in a, hop in a rover and be back to Townsville. Um, but, you know, I had the, I'm over Townsville mindset as well. I don't want to go back there. It's too hot. Um, I'm looking forward to Sydney. I'm looking forward to being in a new unit. Um, and there was even talk back then of, of like, War RAR Commando, which they were named back then, taken over the domestic CT responsibility. So the Australia's counterterrorism uh, national asset was going to be uh, distributed amongst SAS and, and commandos. So that was a kind of a sexy job where you, you know, kicked around in black and worked with the police tactical units around Australia and kind of the force of last resort to resolve any, any hostage recovery. Um, so that was a big selling ticket, I think, for the item, uh, for the unit back then. So a lot of guys were like, you know, that's different. It it probably prolongs your time in the army because you're doing some black role domestic um, stuff as well as potentially overseas deployments. But is that did that actually happen? Because you guys weren't involved in the lint siege. No, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, so it did happen uh, to answer your question. So. The um, they called it the tag, the tactical assault group. So Perth had tactical assault group West, and um, you know that took over, sort of cut Australia down the the centre, and the the west half uh, went to Perth, and the right half went to uh, commandos. So there is a uh, procedure for a, a local um, domestic incident, uh, and they've got to, you know, government obviously sits and they go through checks and balances and the police tactical team get called out. So if they can resolve it, they think they can resolve it, then, then they will. Um, and if they can't, they hand it off, you know, and there's certain checks and balances, like I said, that where they should potentially hand it off because it's deemed as a terrorist incident. I won't go too much into it, but if it's deemed no. a terrorist incident, then You've got an in, in, a, a national asset to deal with it, as opposed to um, local law enforcement that are still doing a lot of warrant stuff and robberies and homicides. So they've, their natural core skill may not be assaulting an aircraft or a bus or a train every day like we were doing. So you haven't really answered the question, though. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't miss that one, Barry. <laughs> Why weren't, if you guys are dealing with that sort of stuff, why didn't you guys go in? What can you say? Can you even comment on that? Oh, yeah, I can. Um, we we were stood up. So our guys, I wasn't there. I'd left the company at that stage. Um, the company I was in got stood up. Um, so everybody got recalled, went to work, you know, were loading magazines and getting their radios ready and getting briefs. Um, and loading the vehicles ready to go um, and in a holding pattern out at Holsworthy while the police uh, TOU, um, Tactical Operations Unit, um, which fall under the State Protection Group, um, were on target with their snipers and their dogs and their assault teams. So they um, they had primacy at that point. So the handover hadn't occurred. Um, you know, our guys were pushing for the handover to take place. So it became a, a, a terrorist incident where we would resolve it, but um, it didn't make it to that phase before they deemed, I guess, that the um, threat became, you know, too too much. So they sent in the TOU guys. Okay. Thank but you. our guys I'll are biting there. at the bit for sure. To get there <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that you guys would have, yeah. 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 Um, let's go back to the early career because... I, I know I jumped a bit forward to the Lint siege uh, situation. You were you went to Timor in the Special Forces, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. What were they doing? I know that we so, had a 
invert like yeah, in, you know good peacekeep peacekeeping sort of over there i've spoken to other military personnel that were over there in the peacekeeping so what was the special forces doing over there we we sent um a crew like a uh, platoon plus which maybe is 40 guys i guess in mid 2006 um and i would um completed the build up and the the um activity for the commonwealth games which so the tag the tactical assault group went down to provide security for the commonwealth games in case an incident occurred but these are all high threat areas um to, was in know, melbourne you're in melbourne yeah so your olympic games your commonwealth games are all high threat um areas so we went down for that um and that was great we're down in melbourne for about three months we were there three months a year before um so that was a great activity operation they called it um so after that i did like a promotion course um uh, to become a sergeant so i'm in singleton doing a um a field promotion course to be a sergeant and all the all the promotion courses i guess just as a sidebar are, are just the biggest drag you know it's all stuff that you know but they've got to officially teach you and you've got to understand the. it's all basic stuff but it's just a nightmare it's three months out of your life that you're sitting around singleton being told how to shoot a machine gun that you've been doing for 20 years so none of it's exciting you don't really learn anything so i'm up there going what the what, why why am i doing this but i wanted to be promoted because sergeants kind of run the unit in as far as training and being lead instructors on explosives and roping and driving and whatever so i needed to do that course because i knew Afghanistan was coming up and I want to be in a, a, a key team commander position, which was a sergeant position. So I said, yeah, I'll do this course at St. Gordon. So I went up there in like July, August, September. And over that time frame, I, I heard that we sent 30, 40 guys to Timor. I'm like, you know, what's happening in Timor? And they're like, oh, well, there's some border issues um, again on the Western border there with Indonesia and there's some incursions. And we didn't get much information. It's like, okay, you know, good luck to the boys. But then on the last couple of days of my course, they're like, hey, Muzz, do you want to come back early? A, yes, I do. Uh, and B, do you want to go to Timor with the next crew that are going? I'm like, this this is great. I don't have to do a march out, like stand on a parade ground to finish my course. I can do an operation and go to uh, Timor. And it was for six months. So I was like, well, yep, sure, I'll go. So I've got a team. And you got your promotion? I got my promotion the year after, um, oh. or the end of that year, yeah, um, and got to Timor. So I got, I got a crew of, you know, 35, 40 guys in Timor. And um, when we got there, we kind of worked out what the mission was, and it wasn't sort of incursions and on the western border there. It's Alfredo Renato was running around causing havoc in 06. Um, so the first commando unit there was to keep an eye on him and report to the government report to, to our hire what he was doing you know they wanted um an asset there prepared to take him down if it come to that they didn't think it would they thought they could negotiate with him and, and get him off the streets because he had about 20 shooters with him 20 guys like a personal security team so he was a, a legitimate threat right 20 guys 20 shooters in timor is a lot so he was driving around just uh, he was meeting with the government behind our back you know, this is how crazy the whole dynamic was. You know, he would meet with them and they'd, um, you know, uh, things would be going well. So they're like, oh, you know, you guys just lay off, give them a couple of weeks and whatever. So then we'll pretend to, you know, um, sort of scope the border out for the incursion um, issue that was sort of non-existent. And then he would cause chaos and havoc again. So then we'd start tracking him and, and actually talking to him as well because um, Timor's not that big. So we had five or six assault vehicles and so did he to get his 20 guys around. So, you know, you think of six vehicles going one way, six vehicles going the other way, the road's only big enough for one. So you, we'd often stop as we were sort of awkwardly passing each other. Wave at each other as yeah, you Yeah, yeah. I had coffee with him a number of times and we talked. Oh my you know, goodness. He he did some training in Perth. He, his English was pretty good. Um, you know, so we would discuss options with him you know not that we had the legitimacy to really to do it um but we're like hey you know if, if you don't do x y and z then you're going to be fine you know if you want to negotiate or or 
you know, raise a, another arm of the government, which is essentially what he wanted to do. You know, if you do it in these ways, it's going to be fine. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll do it my way. So he was passionate about his country. Um, but then I forget it was February sometime is when he, he raided the police station further down south and got all the body armor and the radios and the, the handguns and the rifles. So from that point onwards, we were going to do the job um, to, to uh, arrest him. Yeah, so um, that occurred. And how did that go? So that was my first kinetic um, operation, I guess. So the first time, you know, I, I was involved in a shootout. Um, so we planned, so this was at Sarmay, which was on a hill, sort of halfway um, down to Suwai, down south. So it's, it's you know, the country is only kind of like 50 kilometres from top to bottom, so about 20 weeks down south. He took over a, a particular compound that overlooked the village. Um, so he holed up there. So because I'd spoken to him before and kind of a, a somebody that had, he had seen and I'd you know, we got some kind of rapport, they put me on the helicopter, uh, an SAS warrant officer on the helicopter, some political guys, and we flew to meet him. So we landed just at front of the compound. I got out. I didn't go in. We kind of acknowledged each other. The SAS um, senior guy and the politicians went inside to negotiate his truth. Truce. Um, they come out about an hour later, um, and he didn't. He didn't sign up for the truce. He's pretty much like, bring it on. Let's let's go. So we hopped in the helicopter, flying back. I said, you know, how'd that go? And they're like, well, you know, he didn't give up. So it's it's happening. So as soon as we we got back, we started planning for a. Um, for an assault on the compound. So he, he had his 20 guys and we had to plan for those. Um, we had our SAS element. We put it, brought in another commando element. So we had maybe 50 commandos on the deck and we, we planned up that job that occurred like two, two or three days later. So, we, so he was no longer a problem. After he that. was, he was still a problem. He survived. So w w we had a shootout. Oh. We got five his guys um, and him and three or four others got away. They slipped through the cord and the, the jungle and the terrain up there is quite hectic. It's steep mm. and it's, it's thick and we didn't have a lot of assets. So we had an Orion, um, Australian Orion doing laps, which would give thermal and um, infrared. But within that jungle, within that kind of canopy, he slipped out. Uh, so we got in the shootout we would clean up five of his mates. Uh, but he slipped through. So we we left on the 27th of April. Oh, sorry, 25th of April on Anzac Day. And then they, another element cleaned him up like you know, a couple of months later. Yeah. So and how long more. had you been in? How long had you been in for this stage? I've been in the army. Um, so that was 2000, just on 11 years, 12 years. Okay. So... That was what year in Timor? So it was uh, February 2007. So you missed Kylie and uh, Johnny <laughs> Farnham over there. <laughs> well, they, they were their early days, I think, weren't they? In yeah, I know they were. Yeah. Yeah. Th <laughs> yeah. Thank God. I, I had a few friends that would tell me about the, yeah, you're right, the Farnham days. Um, but they had some good bands, oh, apparently. It's un-Australian if you don't like Johnny, un yeah, if you don't like Johnny Farnham. Come on now. He's been around forever. He's got a couple of classics. Yeah. When did you move up to the team commander role? Was that before you went to Afghanistan or after? Yeah, I, I was on tag as a team commander. Um, the um, domestic CT as a team commander. Um, but then to be deployed as a one of the junior team commanders for the Timor gig was, was great. So I, I got to see how the other two senior team commanders operated. And every team commander's got a specific job, um, whether it's domestic CT or deployed overseas. So there's a whole structure and a whole program as to how they plan and, and what they do. And it's really, it, it's inspiring and, and inspirational to watch. Like every guy do their job, um, you know, so you can get the planning cycle faster and faster and more efficient. Uh, so I was a junior guy, so I could watch, you know, what the senior two dudes were doing. So then the following year, deployed to Afghanistan, I was still in that junior team commander role. Um, so I could take a back seat and just watch how they planned to get us on target, um, the helicopters, 
you know, the engineers, the interpreters, the snipers, where they put these people in the aircraft and what aircraft went to what overwatch position and then what happened on target. You know, there's a specific team commander that, that details what team makes entry in what door or on what roof or through what wall, if we blow a wall up, you know. As a civilian, you don't think about that level of, like you go, okay, they planned a mission, right? They went and did whatever and they kicked in a few doors and got whoever they want to get. But you don't think about, oh, who's going to sit on what air pl- uh, aircraft in what position and, like, you just don't think it's to that level of detail. Yeah, you're right. It is. It, it, it exactly is as to, um, you know, you're reverse engineer when you hop on the aircraft. So you've got your soldiers to, at the back. Um, and it comes down to each seat. You're right. Like we, uh, the third guy off, we may want to be an engineer because we're looking for IEDs potentially. And the fourth guy could be an interpreter because we want to, um, a local interface with the, um, with the locals there, you know, someone to talk to them as the number four and five come in, you know, and so they've got protection in the middle of the assault team. Um, but you're right. There is a lot of planning that goes on as to, how many people each specific aircraft, whether it's a Black Hawk or a Chinook or a MI-17 or a CH-53, how many people they can take at what height during what you know summer or winter it changes. So there's a lot that goes into it. Is there a point where the planning is too much? Because obviously things go wrong on Tugger, right? No, I imagine that probably 99% of them never go to plan. So is there a point where you can over plan and it creates an inability to be flexible on target. It, it does. You're right. It, it does. Yeah. And we, we've learned that early on, I guess, um, whether it was Timor in 2000, 2001 or Timor 2006, you're right. You, you plan for, you know, three or four key um, responses or, um, you know, courses of action. But then after that, it's sort of cuff it, you know, you've set yourself up for what's, what most likely is going to happen and the second and third response. And after that, it's, you know, we've got mature soldiers, guys that can think on their feet. So you've got confidence in your whole team having the ability to, you know, be flexible and to move and shift focus onto a second compound or, you know, a vehicle that's driving away that's now, you know, got, you know, uh, hostages in it, for instance. So there's a lot of different scenarios that you just can't account for in every planning cycle. Um, but mm. we've got, and that's why we pick more mature um, soldiers who have that ability to think laterally and not just be focused on, hey, I need to do this at all costs and I've got one job. You know, we've got guys who are cross-trained as medics and interpreters and explosives guys. So you'd like to think that you pick a more um, well-rounded soldier at the end of the day. He can think on his feet and change. Was that deployment your first time in Afghanistan? Yeah, so... January of uh, 2008, that was my first six-month deployment, yeah. What was the reality like being there compared to the stories that you'd heard and what you had envisaged it to be? Delta Company, who I went with, um, that was their second rotation there. So they did rotation three. You were actually, so you were attached to Delta Company. You didn't go as like a full unit, commando unit over. No, we went as subunits. So we went okay. as, um, you know, two commando um, has got A, B, C, and D, for instance, uh, companies. So Delta Company um, did the January 2008. But oh, they... I was thinking Delta as in American Forces Delta. No, no, you're right. Yeah, okay. they've got their Delta entire unit, which is, yeah, the same size as our entire unit and Perth. Um, but they, did so we had probably 20 operators that did the rotation three in 2006 and one of them's a good mate of mine so i was hitting him up for like you know where are the because we went to tower and count tk they call it um and so you know i asked him a lot of questions before we went you know where's when you were there two years ago now i guess where were the bad guys and what areas did you um control and and what the most likely IED places and the the main roads because they had Root Bear there, which was the main highway to get you from TK down to Kandahar. So that was a key road for us to maintain security on because we got all our resources out of Kandahar. So controlling that 
route, which was route B, was important. So there's a, it was exciting. It was so exciting for me to fly in there for the first time and be on the ground and be war fighting and be with your team and your platoon and, you know, have everything you could possibly want, whether it's cold weather gear or the latest night vision helmets, you know, body armor. It was, it was great to be operationally focused and be the center of attention for, for equipment and assets and intelligence to see the whole war machine come together. was pretty impressive. So what was the reality like though, compared to what you thought? It was, it was freezing to start with. Really? We flew yeah. in in January and it was so cold and it's, there's not a lot of elevations, about 1500 meters there, which is about, you know, four and a half, 5,000 feet. But, um, when you're walking up hills, those first couple of weeks, it takes it out of you, even just at 5,000 feet elevation. Um, so that was a reality was understanding that, you know, you're not as fit as you were two weeks before at Marubra when I do the stairs there at Coogee, I do, you know, a lot of cardio before I got there. And you thought you were fit, but you went over there and the team and the and the guys that were there previously, they they were like built like cheaters by the time they left. So however they got there six months later, they were running up, you know, ten thousand foot mountains like this, like machines. And that kind of conditioning grows on you over over time. So by the, the time you're at three months in, four, five, six months into your trip, you know, you're chasing bad guys up twenty thousand foot, you know, mountains like like it's nothing. But on day one, it's hard. You know, you don't did, have that conditioning. Did the army ever go? Oh, this is a consideration that we need to do high altitude training as a workup for the guys before they go over. Um, not really. Like it was, it was always a thing. Um, so we'd have generally a couple of weeks in country before we went out on missions. Um, so you, you needed to zero and make sure your sight was was level on your weapon. Um, you need to do a handover for, you know, get the latest intelligence and that your target packages for the next tour, uh, get vehicles, go and meet the pilots, understand your air packet for that trip. So there was a lot of stuff going on anyway that would generally last a couple of weeks. Uh, so during those first two weeks in theatre, you would your body would sort of understand, where, you know, how high it was and how difficult it was to get the full amount of air in your lungs. So you would train like hell when you got there. So ideally, you weren't doing any jobs for the first two or three weeks anyway. So you would just do a lot of training. You mentioned air packets, which I'm assuming that's just what type of aircraft and stuff. And you're meeting the pilots. Did How much did you butter up the pilots so you knew that they would go the extra mile? <laughs> <laughs> to come and <laughs> do stuff to get you out. Because if I'm over there, I'm buttering up whoever I need to butter up to make sure they're going to come and, come and do whatever they can. And I'm not saying that they wouldn't anyway, but there's there's doing stuff and then there's doing stuff. You know what I mean? Exactly. You're right. There is. There is, right? It's going the extra mile in a shootout in daytime when you need an extraction and guys are running around with RPGs and PKM machine guns. So it is important to have a good rapport with those guys. You're right. So we would, and to our credit, we had the best mess in country. We had the best food at TK there. We had great Aussie chef crab. We had uh, curly fries, you know, pies and Mars bar ice creams and milk, actually fresh milk, which every, it blew everybody away. You're bringing the Americans in. They're like, oh my God, fresh milk. I can't believe it. I love you guys. Can I, hey, can I stay for lunch or, and, and breakfast? And so that was our key enabler to get guys in and to get um, to bribe them. So yeah, that was key. But um, we had great air packets, and I can't remember how often they'd rotate. Maybe every four to six months as well. But they were kind of off cycle to us. But they were out of TK. We'd have Black Hawks and Chinooks, the CH forty seven. Um, so that was when I got there in oh eight. By twenty ten, we'd have uh, MI seventeens, which were the Russian built old troop lift aircraft um the americans had bought them and and spent a lot of money on them to make sure they're airworthy um, we had the ch-53s we had hueys hang on hang on america was buying aircraft off russia not from russia they were russian made initially yeah and then they okay american made them american spec i guess so they could put americans in the back and put the uk and australians in them 
but it's a good point. They're old. Um, there's stuff falling off left, right, and center, and they leak fuel and oil all over the place. But um, you know, they got us around. Well, I would have thought it would have been cheaper just to build them from scratch. But anyway, so they were flown by Afghanis as well. You know, so you, you generally had an American in with the Afghanis, but sometimes during maybe hot extractions, if we're getting shot at and different aircraft are dedicated to a, a specific landing spot, you know, we may be at a different landing spot and get on an aircraft flown by Afghani pilots. So their skill sets and their abilities maybe, you know, don't match their enthusiasm sometimes. Um, we didn't have a crash, but uh, we didn't do any night flying with them because they didn't know properly how to fly with night vision goggles. Um, so they do yeah. day jobs. Come With day jobs comes more threat because, of course, during daylight, everybody can see a, a, a troop lift coming in and pulls their RPG out from under the bed and tries to shoot it down. So there's significant pucker factor when you're flying. Oh, with... for sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about um, one of the – you had a mass casualty event when you were over there in, in Afghan in 2008. Talk to me about the build up to that and then what happened on the day. Yeah, so that was um we had the luxury of enjoying ourselves at Anzac Bay at, at Tarrant Out there on the twenty fifth of April two thousand eight. We knew we were going out in vehicles for about a week um on the twenty sixth. So we got allocated our two beers on the twenty on the twenty fifth. We enjoyed those two beers and then May or may not have broken into the um, the boozer, um, what do they call it, lock up um, shipping container and got, got a couple more beers out. And then uh, the next day, we all hopped in our vehicles and drove down south um, for our week long patrol, which is, you know, we've done it, you know, five or six times before. Um, but we needed to head through a valley. Um, and there was a village that overlooked the valley that was called China Calais. And we received intel, you know, that was like 50 years old, 40 years old, that the Russians had, had driven through there back in, you know, the 80s um, and got blasted um, with about 70 vehicles that they took through. So the Mujahideen essentially picked off the first vehicle and they picked off the last vehicle and then they just wiped out approximately another 60 or so vehicles in between and kind of killed everybody. So... It was a it was a dangerous bit of ground to drive through, and we kind of underestimated um, that village and that piece of land and that pass, and we drove through anyway. And that was kind of fine; we got through it. Um, so this is now on the twenty seventh. Um, but once we drove through, we got a lot of reporting. We had a lot of assets up in the air, collecting uh, collecting data and communications for us. And we received information that a lot of the teams assumed we were going to drive back through there. So they went up into the hills um, where, you know, 40 years before the Mujahideen had been and took those same positions, firing positions, and kind of waited for us to drive back through. So our hire uh, did a lot of planning and tried to offset that with snipers and some uh, Dutch Apaches and sent us back through. So we went through and... Um, you know, I was in the lead vehicle, so I'm all I'm hearing through our communications guy is, you know, they're talking about hitting us, they're talking about hit it, they're going to hit us soon, it's going to be big, it's going to be big. And when you're in the, the lead vehicle when you can hear all this all this chatter over the radio that they're about to hit us, it, it it's quite confronting. Um, and there's like a 90-degree turn in Trina Calais, the, the main village there. We did the left turn, and we had about 12 vehicles, I guess, so after about four or five vehicles did that, completed that left turn, um, they arced up on us and they just went full auto when RPGs are flying in and heavy machine guns. Pardon me. So the first, you know, five minutes we had four casualties and um, and Jason Marks was hit. Um, and he took an RPG to his vehicle initially. So him and him and the driver were injured. They got out, they ran to the back, they grabbed some rockets and were just about to fire the rockets to the enemy positions when they took some small arms and Jason was, was shot in the head uh, and he died instantly. Um, and one of my other buddies ran from a vehicle behind. He ran like a hundred meters to get to Jason. 
Um, and he caught like a three round burst to his legs just as he got there. Um, so we had four live casualties. We had, we had Jason who was KIA and for the next two hours, we were just trying to fight our way out of there. Uh, we went back essentially the way we came. We had, um, another team from another platoon come in to provide, they had, they brought a Bushmaster. So they had a lot of armor, um, and some heavier machine guns. And we had Dutch Apaches, which were doing laps over the top. But the Dutch, though a little bit weird back then, they they needed to see the target before they would engage. So, you know, a, a helicopter sort of moves. You know, traditionally people think it kind of just hovers there, but it's not going to hover. It, it's in a, a, a pattern and it's going to keep doing runs. So we had Apaches flying over the top. We would nominate targets, but they wouldn't shoot because they couldn't see the weapon systems on the, on the Taliban. Um, so there was a... a you know, miscommunication there. So they couldn't, they weren't, um, you know, within their rules of engagement, they didn't fire. So we were getting more and more rounds and um, coming in on us, more fighters were coming in from the hills because the word got out that, you know, they could light us up and they were dominating us. So um, heaps more fighters were coming in and it was very frustrating as the pilots of the Dutch, Dutch Apache weren't shooting. But we eventually got out there a couple of hours later and got back to TK. So that was kind of the first big shootout, I guess, that I was involved in where we took casualties. Um, and that was that was quite confronting. How does the um, team platoon, I don't know the correct terminology, regroup after an event like that? Yeah, so um, logistically, I guess you look at when down five guys from our platoon of say 35 so you know as far as the teams go that's quite an impact you know every team kind of lost one guy uh, equivalent so we had to get more guys in from australia to backfill those positions so they reached back and got another four or five guys sent over um but you're right it to you know to regroup to to move their equipment out of our team room for instance you know because our down the hospital there before they go to Germany, before they go back to Australia. So there's a logistical element to it as well to make sure that, you know, a new guy's coming in and, you know, do we pause on operations until every team's operational and, and got a five, a minimum of five guys. Um, so, you know, there's an emotional element to it. You know, there's, a, I guess, you know, all of us, there's an, a revenge element to it. You know, let's go back in there and, and, you know, take out these guys, get some more intelligence and take the fight to the bad guys again. Um, so there is quite a bit to it. You're right. You know, it's not just a, a case of, uh, you know, reset and we're off again. There's there's quite a lot of work that needs to happen. Is there a, a, a mandatory, um, not a stand down, but a, a period afterwards that you just, you know, oh, okay, let's take a knee for 24 hours just to regroup emotionally from that? Or is it sort of, this depends on what's going on in sort of in the field of battle rather and where you need it. So it doesn't, you may not actually have time to take stock of what happened. Yes. Uh, there, there is a, a, a time frame for that to happen. Um, like you said, so I think when we got back, like a couple of days later, we had a couple of beers cause we had to do the ramp ceremony for Jason. Uh, so the ramp ceremony means that Australia flies in a C-17 or a C-130. Uh, to pick up the casket. Um, so there's a whole procedural element to what happens next um, a couple of days later. So we essentially do our farewells at TK there and all the Australians sort of close ranks and come in together. Um, you know, we get representatives from the Brits and the Dutch and the the um, Americans. And, um, you know, it's it's quite, it's what, well, it's very well done, um, and we sort of walked the casket out. It's in one of the back of the six-wheel vehicles out to the flight line. It gets loaded up and sent straight back to Australia. Um, so naturally, there's some downtime built into um, taking a KIA anyway, so we can sort of you know reflect on it and, and say our goodbyes as well as sort of regroup and, and reposition ourselves for future operations. Are you able to request a certain nationality as air support? 
So if there's if the Dutch are having a different rules of engagement and that wasn't effective on that target for you, you didn't get the air support that you needed. Can you say I only want the Brits or I only want the Americans or whatever other co- coalition force was out there? Yeah, and we, we did have that ability in 2010, 11, 12, 13. Um, back then we didn't. We we had what we had. So even as far as our helicopters, we were limited. We had one packet. Uh, and that was it. So that was Blackhawks and Chinooks. Um, but you always could request um, Apaches, which, which were the attack helicopters. But you're right, back then they were Dutch. I think it was only a year later they become American, which was great, which was awesome. So they their rules of engagement were more in line with ours. Um, so we could talk them on the targets. Um, you know, So if a Taliban, for instance, would shoot at the helicopter and shoot at us. And by the time the helicopter had done a lap and got its sensors on, they would put the radio and their weapon system down behind a rock and stand there so they wouldn't get blasted because the sensors are picking up a lone guy in a field that could be a farmer. And we're like, hey, that's a guy shooting at you. So they'd do a couple of laps. And then you know, by the end of it, we could manage to talk them on through us informing them of what this guy was. He's not a farmer. He's he's packing an RPG and a PK PKM and he's got a radio. So, you know, hostile intent blasting. I suppose if that that's probably a lot more reassuring if you're going out and you know, I mean it's not you're not playing tiddlywinks over there, you know? No, no, that's right. And and throughout the that I guess seven or eight years that we were at high tempo, the we we'd receive more and more assets. So more and more different helicopters. We, we were getting, you know, net results. So they wanted to move um, the assets to where they were getting results and effects. And we were, so we were taking down, you know, high value individuals, mid-level guys, low value targets, as well as later the drug labs. So when you're getting good results and you're getting, you know, runs on the board, they'll tend to um, push assets your way, which which worked out so well for us. So we got more and more helicopters, more and more UAVs, um, you know, your Predators and your Reapers. Um, so you always had an asset in the air that could do thermal and, and radio collection and infrared. Is that frustrating, though? If you're a new platooning country and you don't have the rungs on the board for them to give you those assets, is it hard because you've got to sort of almost work under resourced to prove yourself and then it's harder to prove yourself when you don't have the resources. <laughs> That's exactly exactly the case. Of course. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's just okay, good to know that the armed forces is <laughs> doing <laughs> we'll leave that one there, Murray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You deployed in two thousand and nine as personal security to the PM, how different, A, was that enjoyable? Let's no, ask that. No, it wasn't. It was. It's, no. I mean, it's enjoyable as far as, you know, I'm still single at this point, so it's enjoyable as I'm sitting around Maroubra, uh, where I lived in a one-bedroom apartment overlooking the beach, or I'm deployed overseas with the boys back on the tools, um, doing what I was trained for, you know, staying at Dubai for maybe a week on the way over and maybe a couple of days on the way back, we get good deployment money and I get my weapon system, my goggles and my body armor. So everybody wants to do it. Those little two to three, four week jobs, everybody everybody wants it. Those PSDs, we'd call them personal security details too. Um, back then it was Kevin Rudd and then Julie Gillard and then it was a Chief of Army, Chief of Air Force, Navy, Chief of the Defence Force. So there's always somebody coming and going, whether it was um, Anzac Day or it was Christmas or Easter or whatever, you know, or whether it's just a regular send your head of state over so they can have a, a bit of a chin wag about how the war's going and strategic policy and blah, blah, blah. So there's maybe 10 of those trips every year. And they were good trips to get on, but to answer your question, you're dealing with, you know, the PM who's got his own agenda, who doesn't want to listen about which way to put his body armor on. And you've got all his PAs who think they're somebody's, you know, they're nothing to us or nobody to us, but would look at us to pick up their bags, to put them on the C-17, you know, not understanding that we're there as a 
security detail for the, the PM, for instance, you know, and you've got everybody leaving. Kind of need your hands free. Yeah, yeah. They were leaving weapons and backpacks and laptops on aircraft and you name it, it happened. Um, so it's kind of funny and amusing at the same time as well as being frustrating. I understand there's a, a, a rank system in the army and I understand there's obviously a professional uh, etiquette that you need to adhere to, but do you have the opportunity to really be frank to someone like the PM or some of the um, higher ups, obviously, that you were doing the close protection for? Do you have the ability to be like, mate, this guy's like, I don't know, whatever, this general or whoever it was that was in charge, he's a, he's a, He's a wanker. Get him. Get rid of him. Like, yes. do you have the ability to say we we need this? We're not getting this as a support. Like, help us out. Yeah. Yes. We we do. Um. And how we how we get that is we. It's not normally um us whinging or bitching about the hierarchy that we take. It's normally us getting pushed back when we fly to Kandahar or Bastion or um Kabul with Australia not manning up and giving us the vehicles for the next leg or the aircraft or the, um, you know, the QRF potentially stood up. So if, in case we got shot down, we'd have the Dutch as a QRF or we'd have the Americans, a team that would fly in to secure us. So it's always a pushback about us getting what we needed to support a successful trip from the PM or the Chief of Army or Defence Force or whatever. But what you had is the ability to to use their rank to get stuff done. So I, I did four months in Kabul, for instance, in 2011. So our our boss was a, um, he was a Lieutenant General. Uh, sorry, wrong. He was a Major General. So he, when I, when I would ask for things, whether it was vehicles or helicopters, I carried the rank of him. So I could drop the hammer on colonels and brigadiers and majors because I carried the rank of my uh, principal, which was, you know, a major general. So that's how we got around that. And you could actually make stuff happen, uh, which is quite a unique situation to have, right? Where you can request tanks or um, a QRF force or more vehicles based on you wearing their rank, because that's the, the job you're doing for the day. So that's a, yeah, yeah, quite a unique situation to be in. It sounds like there's a lot of, we want you to go and do this job, but yet we're not going to give you the tools to go do it. And we're going to make it really <laughs> difficult from an admin point of view for actually facilitate what we want you to do. Yeah, it is. And, and over the course of the war for us, it got easier and easier. Like there was a lot of red tape to start with. And there's kind of a lot of red tape at the end in 2013, 2014. But in the middle, there was no bullshit. That's what was so good about it was you didn't have to send a month early request for ammunition or medical equipment or food or transport, right? And there was no risk management policies, RMPs back then, you know, you didn't have to submit a risk management to, to fly, you know, four Blackhawks from A to B. You just got in them, you spoke to the pilots, you made sure everybody was aware of what's going on, everybody had been briefed and you made shit happen. So that was, that was, an unbelievable atmosphere to operate in as a SF soldier was to have, you know, pick and choose whatever whatever was there you could use, uh, which was great. You know, and it didn't happen before the war, and it certainly didn't happen post twenty fourteen for us. Uh, but during um, those years, it was great to be able to reach into the war machine and pick out whatever you wanted for that particular job or that particular operation, um, and with no holds barred, with no red tape and no backlash. Um, it was great. And that's why everybody wanted to make the most of it. Guys wanted to go back trip after trip after trip, me included. I didn't want to stay back in Australia. I knew it was going to finish at some point. And to do your actual job, to get paid really good money, to be, you know, taking the water, the Taliban, it was just, this This isn't going to last forever. I love it. I want to keep going back year after year. And everybody was just, couldn't get enough of it. You know, professional, mature soldiers who were just, can't wait for the next trip next year you know do you think that they've learned i mean obviously there was more red tape at the end do do you think that they've learned that lesson uh in terms of future conflicts that to remove the red tape and let the let the people the soldiers on the ground just get on with it and make it happen yeah and it's always a, a push and shove right there's there's 
elements that need to happen and there's you know functions for every key position they got to make sure that everybody listens to you know all these key positions um but who, know, who knows right like i talk to guys in the unit now who who just blow my mind when they're talking about how hard it is to book a range and just go and shoot pistol for the day uh, you know because the war's over so now it's back to full red tape and and um you know checks and balances and uh convoluted processes of just opening a range putting a red flag up shooting pistol and going back it's almost not worth doing it's that hard and it's that convoluted uh the computer system the booking system the this and that so they do make it hard um you know and i'd like to think we've got a lot of professional guys who push through that but to book a week's worth of training is no joke these days to book ambulances and food and weapons and armorers in case your weapon, you know, malfunctions at the range. And, you know, there's so much that goes into a week worth of, you know, old school shooting that it's, it's quite difficult. In 2010, you went back to Afghanistan. Rewind a little bit. There was a mission that was meant to be a three-day mission that ended up five days. Talk me through that situation. <laughs> that was hectic. That was probably the most chaotic five days of my life. Um, we'd only just got there. So we, you know, they reverse season to us, of course, right? They're in the Northern Hemisphere. So, you know, mid-year is hot in mm. Afghanistan. And, um, you know, December, January is cold and winter and snow issues. Um, so we rotated in mid 2010. Um, and our first job was at a, a, a town, a village down south in Shawalikot called Gombad. Um, so we, we were taking the whole Delta company. The little there. ominous. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so we were taking, you know, 70, 80 shooters into this valley. And there'd been enough um, intelligence and information coming out that, you know, there was enough guys down there to warrant the whole force going in, which was great for us. So everybody got tested. Everybody had only been there like a week or two. Um, so we all went in. We went in, you know, the cover of night at like three in the morning with, you know, a dozen helicopters. And um, we get out and we, we take over our target compound. You know, everyone's got a compound or a hillside or a valley that they're going to stay in for the next three days. Um, and mine was a compound with the whole platoon. So essentially it's kind of 30 guys in and out of this compound for the next three days, which was the plan. Um, and we'd just send patrols out. You would send, you know, a five-man team here, five-man team there. And it was hot, so hot. Um, so water was an issue. Um, so you would take in, you know, 10, 12, 15 litres for yourself, but you'd go through that patrolling out, probing the enemy and probing the village throughout the day. Um, so by the end of the three days, we'd been in a number of gunfights. Um, but what had happened was the valley had come over with a certain, certain um, dust that would come down, right? So uh, um, helicopters... You would think, you know, as long as I can see a target, they would land there. So for us to be extracted, I thought was a no-brainer. They can see us, we can see them. But down this big, massive valley, there was just enough dust. And I think they needed a mile, they would call it. So the helicopters wouldn't come in if they couldn't see a mile worth of visibility. So three days turned into four. And we're getting low on ammunition because all teams were getting in the contact. You know, we were all um, in gunfights with with the enemy, and we'd get shot at every afternoon that from a, a village about I don't know a kilometer away. Um, so when you so, say that you're probing villages, what does that mean? I mean, we'd send out patrols, we'd send out um, teams in different directions. Um, we would monitor. We had lots of predators and reapers, which were your unmanned aerial vehicles, which could collect on data and individuals, but because it's hot, it's hard to get a thermal signature, um, even throughout the night. So with those assets, we could do infrared, we could pick out where the bad guys were, and then we'd send out a team the next day to intercept those guys. Um, so it was, it was target rich down there. Um, we, there was no drug labs or anything back then. There were cells of bad guys that were hitting up, but 
by day four, the, the, the dust had settled in and along this valley and we couldn't get extracted. So day four turned into day five and now we're down to pretty much zero water, zero food. Radio batteries were becoming an issue. So I'd get everybody in my team, for instance, to turn off their radios so we could just use mine and I'd use everybody's battery so I could communicate. So by the time day five rolled around, it was it was very critical that we got out that day at some point. So we kind of, um, we manoeuvred and we worked out that the dust was better on this day than the next day. Um, so we moved to a village that kind of overlooked a part of the valley and knew that we were going to get extracted there at like seven in the morning. So we got there about four in the morning. We hid kind of in the rocks. And then at about, I don't know, 6.30, we could hear the helicopters coming in. So they sent a bunch of attack helicopters first. So we had plenty of Apaches to suppress the enemy because the predators and the reapers had picked up that the enemy was coming in. They knew we were going at some point and they worked out today because we'd all moved that it was going to happen. So we had one platoon about a kilometer away. We have my platoon here. You know, we were in like a 300 meter circle. We could hear the, the helicopters coming up the valley. They had a number of big Chinooks, the twin bladed helicopters behind that all the troops, all of us would get in. Um, and what we also had at that point was like a big six wheel motorbike um, that carried extra ammunition, extra rockets, extra grenades, you name it, that was on this big vehicle, six wheeled vehicle that I had on the next rotation. Um, so this thing malfunctioned and wouldn't drive because we would just drive it on the back of the helicopter. And then, you know, 20 guys on and the next helicopter, 20 guys, next helicopter, 20 guys, and we'd all fly away. That was great. But we couldn't start get this thing started and it had a lot of valuable equipment on it with rockets and grenades and stuff. So the helicopters come in, they land, all the enemies shooting at us, they're shooting at the helicopters. My helicopter had 18 bullet holes in it. So all the all the guys get on. We can't get the bike to start. So we run off the back. We're trying to problem solve this thing in a couple of seconds so we can drive it on. We couldn't do it. So we end up taking off. Troy, who you've spoken to previously, and I've heard both his podcasts, he got blown over um, and he hit his head. So luckily our helicopters kind of stayed on the deck, stayed on the ground for a little bit until he come to. So he's talking to the Preds and the Reapers. He's talking to the Apaches. He's convincing the Apache they need to blow up the motorbike that we're leaving behind. So it was a bit of a shit fight, but it was a controlled shit fight. Troy finally gets on. He's talking to um, the um, attack helicopter, convinces them to put a missile and some sm and some 30 mil explosive tip round cannon into the into the motorbike. So they blow that up, and we all fly away. Um, We'd had a number of new guys that had come in at Delta Company just prior to that trip. So there's probably six or seven new guys. This was their first operation. So by the time we get back to TK, they're like, holy shit. <laughs> Is that what happens every time you go out? <laughs> and we're like, nah, actually, that was pretty bad. Normally, they aren't that bad. <laughs> what was Troy like to work with? Because, I, I mean, I only know him as a... I mean, I've never been in the military, so I know I know him in a very different context to to you. Um, so I haven't seen I've seen the sweet Troy, and although he's not someone that I'd ever want to cross, I'm interested to know what he was like like serving with. <laughs> he he was funny. So that was his first gig with us. Um, he'd come across, and we all got new JTACs. So that's a Joint Terminal Attack Controller. So he's got a lot going on. Like those guys, a JTAC within your platoon, you've got one JTAC, and then you've got other guys who are JTAC qualified who can talk to aircraft and drop bombs and get extracted and talk to Medivac Blackhawks, for instance. So he's got a lot of shit going on. He's got two or three radios. He's got a little satellite antenna radio thing that he can do on the run in case we're in a firefight. He can point it at a satellite and, and get satellite link. Um, so he he's very busy, you know, at those key times when we're being inserted or we're being extracted. He's talking to six or seven helicopters. Um, you know, he's trying to run with the rest of us and not get shot at. He's in, you know, he's shooting his own weapon 
and he's controlling all the air. So he's controlling the jets if we've got F-15s or F-18s. Uh, on another day in 2012, he's controlling a medivac helicopter, which is a Black Hawk and, a, and an Apache, attack Apache come, coming in to pick up our wounded guys, as well as uh, our extraction aircraft packet, which is another set of Americans in another set of six helicopters. So he's he's definitely got his ass hanging out most of the time, talking to people on radios and trying to deconflict where the teams are, so they can drop bombs or fire their rockets, you know, in support of us. So he's he's got to be on point, and he was great. He was good at it. I think he undersells um, his intelligence a lot of the time in regards to what it took to do that job. So yeah, yeah it's just interested. In terms of uh, 2012, you're a platoon sergeant at that stage and you're back in Afghanistan working normally, not doing any close protection stuff. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Yep. Another combat tour, six month regular combat tour. How many combat tours did you end up doing? I did um, three six monthers. I did mm -hmm. a couple of PSDs and I did a four month. A uh, long PSD in Kabul in 2011. Any, so is Kabul Iraq? No, Kabul was just across the, the border there from Pakistan, which is their capital. So that's the one that they withdrew, the Americans withdrew, you know, a couple of years oh, ago now, yeah. I guess. Yeah, that shit's I was like... going to ask you about that. Yeah. What made you want to get out? Because you got out in, not long after that last rotation what made you want to get out so for me it was i was going higher up the chain so I'll, i would have become a a warrant officer at some point um mm. so that meant like i spoke previously about do, doing those promotion courses yeah they they get worse the further you go up the chain <laughs> like they are hideous things to do like learning how to march and how to teach marching, learning military law, you know, because they want to charge everybody for being late at work or spitting on the ground or whatever it is, right? The army gets a hard on for charging people, you know, for doing menial, you know, infractions, but they love it. So you had to learn a lot. And for me, I just didn't enjoy that stuff. And I knew there was everything was becoming um, digitized on the computer. So for me, you know, even running a range, like I said before, right, it was a week yeah. of this to run a, a three that's hour. That's two-figure typing, everybody that's listening. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I hated the drop boxes and admin and, you know, words, spreadsheets, PDFs, as you know. So I, I knew I was going to do a lot more of that. And the war was over for us in 2013. So... For us, there was no more Afghan trips. We didn't didn't know Iraq was coming up, and even so, it wasn't kinetic for us. We weren't outside the wire, taking it to the bad guys. So, um, for me, it was all promotion courses and being in the office and organising the activities for the junior soldiers to do. And I think I was quite selfish, to be honest. Like I was in the army for me, right? I wasn't a lifer. I wasn't going to stay in there for forty years. Um. I was in there to tick my boxes, to tick my adrenaline, to do cool stuff. And once I wasn't doing that, I was always going to leave. Um, so I delayed being promoted for years and I was quite good at it. Um, just putting yourself in different positions and <laughs> not being promoted, which was great because nobody in special forces wants to be promoted. If they do, there's something wrong with them because the higher and the quicker you go up, you know, there's only one way. You can't come back down. So while the trips are on and while there's plenty of kinetic stuff overseas and you're doing cool stuff, there's no incentive to get promoted. What, for an extra 2000 a year, maybe, um, you know, to get rank. So there's no pay incentive and you're going to do more paperwork and computer work. So you'll find, and whether a lot of the other guests have, have you know, spoken about this, there's no incentive to be promoted quickly. Um, so they were finally going to get me in 2013 and 2014. So I saw the writing on the wall and I had a couple of friends that were in the UAE running, um, some subcontract work for the UAE government where we were training their special forces, um, in Abu Dhabi. So I hooked up one of those jobs. 
I'm surprised that you're allowed to go and train another country's special forces. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that was highlighted a couple of years ago now, where I think yeah. the, the, the media reached out to government and they're like, hey, you guys are training, you know, the UAE, for instance, they're training UAE soldiers. So they put the whole, you know, mercenary spin on it that we're over there just training them to be rogue and do crazy stuff overseas. It wasn't the case. It was stuff that we were doing in the army. Anyway, I was in the tactical assault group in the tag over there in 2013 training their guys. So fast forward a year and a half and I'm doing it as a civilian, but the same job as I did a year and a half before in the army. So it was sanctioned by the government, but, you know, for, for whatever reason, that particular year, they're like, you know, what are we doing training the UAE guys, um, you know, war fighting, when one day they could be on the other side, you know. Yes, I think that there was a pilot a little while ago that was done, but he was training Chinese pilots, so I think yeah. it might be a little different. Yeah. yeah, I've heard about that, this guy. <laughs> yeah. It was in the media. I don't know his name or whatever. People can go Google it. In terms of the transition, how hard has it been? So you were in the, let me take a step back. How long were you in the UAE doing that for? Uh, four and a half years. So you're still around sort of the military culture over there? Yes. Yeah, you are. You, Yep. So, but tax-free, good, good incentive oh, in tax itself. tax-free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, it's like a four-hour day, five-hour day. You're home by like one o'clock. Oh, wow. Over there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's so hot and because, you know, um, maybe their work et etiquette is not like it is in Australia. So everyone's keen to head home just after lunch. So how has it been then coming back to Australia and I'm assuming no longer sort of in that military culture? How, how hard has that transition been? That's, that's been really hard, I'll be honest with you. I didn't mm. think it would be that hard. Like when I left the army, I was kind of cooked. Anyway, look, I was glad to leave the army. Like I, I ticked every every box I wanted to tick as a junior, senior team commander. I'd, I'd been in plenty of kinetic gunfights. I ticked a lot of boxes that I wanted to tick. So I was I was happy to leave and go to the UAE. But to be honest, after four and a half years over there of pistol roping, driving, explosive entry, I'd I just I'd had enough of that as well. And tactically, I just couldn't be bothered seeing another pistol or set of body armor or night vision goggles. So I was, I was happy to come home after those four and a half years. Um, and, and it wasn't easy coming back either. Right. So you're trying to fit into a mold back here of what society wants. And it's like, you know, um, you just get a regular job or, or whatever you're going to do and just wind it back um, from going flat out to, you know, kick it along in first gear. And that's quite difficult to do for motivated. And you know, I, I put myself in that alpha box of a guy that enjoyed it and loved it when I was doing it, but now I kind of miss it. And it's not easy to wind it back and do everyday life stuff. Um, mm. You know, you, there's one part of your brain that's like, oh yeah, it's awesome. I just, I can sit on the couch and I can watch a movie and go to the gym a couple of times a day and do this. And walk the dog. Have coffees that are too hot. The coffees and wine about cold coffees. <laughs> but there's the other part of your brain that's like, hey, fuck that. When are we doing some cool stuff? Um, so you kind of want it, but you don't. So it's a weird, weird dynamic in your head. Um, yeah. So that that's been quite the transition and quite the challenge is to um, find out where you fit in society these days. Do you feel that, because I have an opinion on it, but do you feel as an ex-military personnel that Australians appreciate the service? Um, in general, yes. Yeah. Um, I've probably only heard it a handful of times, to be honest. Like America's, they live off that and, it, and mm. it's part of their culture is to thank people for their service. And it's cliche, cliche and, it, and sometimes it sounds corny, but it's actually good to hear sometimes. Um, you know, thanks for the, what you did and, you know, what you did for Australia's interests and, you know, 
whatever your motivation to get over there, thanks for doing it. Mm. Um, so I think in general, yes, Australia does appreciate what we did. That's um, good. And that's that's good to to hear occasionally. It is. Yeah. Um, because from an outsider's point of view, I don't, and I don't know if it's because you guys don't talk about it as much. Like obviously America's very rah, 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 um, USA. So I don't know whether or not it's because you guys don't talk about it as much. So therefore it's probably not out there in the media as much, but I, I personally don't think that, that you guys are as appreciated as much as you should be. Yeah. And, and thanks for saying that. It, yeah, I know it is weird. It's quite the conundrum. It's like you, you kind of want to be, in a sense, recognised, but on the same token, you know, you'll find special forces guys around the world kind of shy away from that as well. So it's you kind of want it, but it's embarrassing and you shy away from it when it happens. So I don't know where it sits, you know. Um, it is good to hear it, you know, as a, whether it's a collective people, you know, saying thanks very much for your service or it's even a one-on-one. Um, and and for instance, like the Taliban were a bunch of bad guys doing some hideous mm. stuff that I won't put you through, um, and or tell you the stories. But they were they were murdering, um, you know, women, kids, you know, men, boys, girls, and doing everything in between to them um, before we got there. And I'm sure they're doing it now. The people that don't support or do support the government. And don't support the Taliban. Like they've gone in a couple of seconds in a particular village when the Taliban gets there. So all the locals and the villagers who supported the government were like happy, really genuinely happy that we were there and we were taking down the Taliban. Um, so you know that that's good to hear, and it's good to see that we had a net effect at the end of the day. Um yeah, because they had no mercy for for the local Afghani people if they supported any government other than the Taliban. How hard was the withdrawal for you guys? Um, for me personally, like I didn't see a lot of it. Like my rotation finished mid-2012. Um, so I come back and we still did, you know, another six month, the end of 2012, 2013. I think we did another one and a half rotations because um, I was doing domestic counterterrorism. So for me, I really didn't see you know, a lot of the the, the dynamic of what, how it happened and and you know the, logistically how it happened. My understanding was we left most stuff there. We brought home big generators, uh, which you know for Australia is pretty good. Um, they're worth millions of dollars. The generators that kept us going for like ten years, but all the buildings um, and a lot of the hardware maybe some of the vehicles were left behind not to the extent of the americans of course um but it was like you know cost versus um you know time and energy factor and they just realized we'll just leave a lot of the stuff there you know naturally it's going to degrade anyway so the enemy is not going to be able to use it and you know to fly extra c-17s in to take this back you know brings extra risk to the aircraft and the crews to bring home you know some kind of vehicle it just wasn't worth it now that you're out you finish in the uae what's life like for you now life's good it's good it's challenging good. like i'm trying to be stimulated each each day and i'm lucky like my fiance is a gem she's a legend uh and she supports me um, so she's like, you know, you're a bit of a, how do I put this? You're a bit of a, a, a unique basket case. I'll look after you. So she understands me and puts up with my little OCD, whatever's going on at that point in time. And I was going to you know, ask why are you a unique basket case? Where's the basket case come in? I mean, we all are, I guess, right? Like, yeah, this is true. Yeah. Every guy that comes back, who's actually worth his weight and salt in my opinion. Oh, I wasn't even meaning return veterans. I was just like everybody in general of us. <laughs> well, they are. You're right. <laughs> but uh, I'm fortunate because she, she really gets me. And so life is easy for me in that sense, right? I'm not fighting a partner that doesn't get it. So, you know, a lot of the guys have partners or wives or kids that kind of um, get it, which is, which is great because 
it is tough. It's tough being asked to do what we were asked to do and come back and just then go to Coles and, and you know, wait in line or have somebody run over your toes with the trolley and not lose the plot. Like, that's quite a quite a challenge. I sense that this has happened to you, that you've had toes runneth over us. Oh, you name it. You name it, it's happened. And I kind of look for it, right? I can sense it. Oh, I can see it. And I don't encourage... I just think people are, are very, um, you know, unaware of their surroundings. And, you know, I um, walk around. I like to think I've got my shit together and, you know, I can I can sense stuff. But, you know, that's all you got these days. The war's over. You know, what are you going to do? You know, guys, take up skydiving or scuba diving or go-karts or car racing or whatever it is to tick that adrenaline box Um I don't know what to do. I've tried all of those things and, and they don't do chasing it Chasing cows around. Chasing cows around a paddock and digging holes. Is yeah. it for me? It's as crazy as life gets. Yeah. And I I did do my research and heard that you've um gone to the, or seen the light rather, and adopted a cat. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. Cat's cool now. For I know, sure. right? For the first 50 years of my life, it was like, who wants a cat? They don't do anything. They're the best. Yeah, they're the best. They're the best. I could literally be the crazy old man, you know, the crazy old woman with 50 cats, I think, at some point. Yeah, exactly. I think that people either love cats or have never had a cat. So that's my theory. Yeah. I've yep. obviously had cats and have a cat, so that's fine. What What do you think is the um, main main lesson that you want to teach your kids now in regards to the lessons that you've learned? In terms of your career, yeah, I um, I would have to say hard hard work, and that's you know everybody would say that when they're directing an opinion to their kids, I guess. But it's like nothing nothing's going to come easy, and it starts with small stuff, right? So it's putting your cup into the dishwasher, it's putting you know dirty clothes in the basket, it's helping out where you can around the house. It's all that small stuff that kids these days are too interested playing whatever minecraft or you know snapchat you would have been a really good warrant officer yeah yeah i know that worries me <laughs> you should have got ahead and got the promotion oh forget about it no way there's no way so, there would have been laptops being frisbeed out all the windows once i come up against a jpeg problem or something yeah it's a hard work so it's a little, but it's the little things that you talk about. So it's not necessarily little, going out and digging post holes. It's literally no. just attention to detail. Yeah. And I think they live in a world now, don't they, where everything's instantaneous. Like if they want something that's there, grab it, take it, you know, get a loan for it or whatever. There's no work hard element to it, you know, across the board. I don't think there is. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to try and instill in our boy who's only 12 is that um you know take pride in what you do and and leave the room and leave the house in better condition than what you found it when you walk out for instance start small you know those little wins i'll take them yeah if you have one so if that's your message to your kids what's the one message that you'd like the australian public to know oh yeah right okay that was sprung on me that's a good one and a deep sorry a deep, deep question <laughs> that was gave... gonna be my final question <laughs> God. yeah um australian public yeah that's Our um cvs that have got no i like no, got no idea like we don't know we 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 actually conceptually can have no idea of what you guys have done and you know it's amazing that there's people in the world like you guys that do do that so what do you think in terms of what should we know about your service and the military in general that you think that we don't know i, I think it's just understanding that there's soon going to be a lot of old angry dudes who are kicking around and to uh to give them a break like of what 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 gear we've been running fifth gear wide open for 20 years um, as a nation and, you know, as an army and Navy and an air force, 
and now nothing's happening or soon you know nothing's going to be happening there'll be periods when nothing's well, going on yeah and to is uh there, to understand is there Murray going to be nothing oh, going on yeah <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Hopefully I'll get an invite and get throw the tools back on. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it won't come to that. No. I so don't a lot of angry men bad. running around. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's a challenge for every single one of them. Like you look at, I guess, you know, the, the Burton report that's going on now and you look at the Royal Commission into, into defence suicide and there's a lot of guys out there, a lot of women and guys now who are in a, a challenging position of trying to work out where they fit in in a society. Um, you know, so it's a work in progress, I think, for a lot of veterans. Um, you know, trying to still be relevant, um, still feel like you're contributing to society, still feel, you know, you've got something to offer the family, um, besides war fighting, right? Because nobody wants that at the moment so that's what you're good at that's what you've been doing for 20 years and yet there's no market for it you know that's hard what can what can people that haven't served what can we do to help you guys like if we've got a mate that's an, a veteran what do you guys want what do you need well, do you need a yeah, big hug do you, should we hug you good, guys more good point i could do with a hug for sure <laughs> but Actually, that's a really good question. I think it's turn off Netflix for a night or a day or a week and listen to podcasts like yours, right? Or l listen to um, a documentary or a podcast. And so you can understand what, what veterans are going through or what they've done or, you know, what they've been exposed to or what the, how bad the Taliban were in their heyday. Um, you know, forget about Netflix for a day. You know, forget about the actors and the politicians and the celebrities who think they're somebody's, you know, have a listen to some real people telling real stories um, about real stuff, you know, as opposed to watching the latest housewives of wherever the hell um, or some uh, some miniseries that doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, watch a documentary or watch watch this podcast. Murray, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing some other guest suggestions that you have for me as well. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Fiona. I appreciate the invites. Good chat. The One Moment Please podcast. Yeah.